We cannot forget that we are part of a whole. Let's reconnect and stand united. Trees and Seeds is a global movement to unite forest and ocean conservation worldwide through film activism, bringing together local community activism and global education through film screening, panels, cleanups, tree planting, workshops, art, and music. Our collective effort to conserve the forest, the ocean, and the flora and fauna gives us all strength. We must take collaborative action across all stakeholders to push for systemic change from communities, governments, enterprises, and NGOs. Together, in locations around the world, our global team, Blue Community members, and local partners are uniting to harness the power of film to bridge local and global knowledge gaps. Just as our human health is determined at a cellular level, the health of our planet is determined by the health of our communities. We believe that it starts in our backyards, in our local communities that make up our one global community. It's how we work and collaborate with these local groups, the experts that deeply understand their local barriers and concerns, and how we can best support these local efforts that drive real change to protect our land and hope. Take part in this global movement by joining an event, hosting an event, watching and sharing our film loudly, or acting as an individual. Trees and Seeds builds sustainable connections that allows us to preserve and conserve the planet we share with our neighbors. Visit the Trees and Seeds website to join this worldwide festival. Thank you very much. Hey, David. Um, so I'm going to start here with our, this is a webinar on the impact of films and do we, do films really create actionable impact as part of our uh, film with Trees and Seas Festival. And I have with us today, we have David Ruck. There we go. Um, First, let me introduce myself before I start, since I don't have somebody to introduce myself. I'm Julie Anderson. I'm the CEO and founder of Plastic Oceans International. I've been working in public health, have a science background, um, been working in public health to communicate science and information to, commu at, to the community level to make better and more informed um, decision making at the community level. Been working in this field for a little over 25 years. Um, and started Plastic Oceans with the use of film and to really start to, I started to see the use of film as a way to collectively bring together the how information is spread to different communities. Um, and I think that we, we've seen the power of film to, or at least I've directly seen it, and we've seen the power of film to inform and inspire people to learn about different their community other communities and and the world itself and beyond just human communities but um, environmental communities and how we interact and the power of film has really been inspirational and informative in that process um i've had the pleasure of working with david and seeing how he works and it's been truly inspiring um he, he had he is the film director of the eerie situation that Plastic Oceans helps distribute and continues to use because it is so powerful, the message of agricultural runoff. It really highlights the importance of water security, how water secure, how we, how our systems manage water security, um, our water treatment, and really highlights that importance and that system. And, and the way that he came about developing this film is, is very inspiring in terms of how he really collected um, the perspectives of different stakeholders within that community and how it does have a trickle, a domino effect to, and relates to other communities around the world. Um, David has spent the last two decades exploring environmental and science-based issues through video storytelling. And after his work in the National Oceanic and Atmospheric administration, also known as NOAA. Um, he, he started a production company called Great Lakes Outreach Media, and he works with different governments and different nonprofits in the private sector, different stakeholders to really explore the deeper stories about environmental issues to really create a greater public awareness. And David, I am so glad that you can join us today. Um, I'm 
going to give a little bit of a background framework before I start delving in and giving you questions. Sure. Uh, so. If we well, thanks for to, having me here. Fantastic. Good to see you. Um, if we could go to the next slide, I guess it'll be actually two slides, I think, at this point. If I, if I could have you. Oh, there we go. Next slide. I, I was going to start with just a brief history of, and this is very brief. This is a general overview of documentaries. And if we see documentary filmmaking, historically, the, imp the, the purpose of documentaries was always to inform and to give perspective of an issue or what's going on in the world, what's going on within our communities, with outside of our communities, in, within our world. And historically, this process of film, documentary filmmaking has evolved due to technology and time, place, um, and context. And his, the, the term documentary actually was coined to describe nonfiction only in 1926. Um, and then for the next couple decades, it was really used for propaganda. Um, you have to imagine that the cameras were not readily available. So these were really coming down from the government perspective and war times were at this time. Um, and it was really, this was really the documentary use. Um, as technology improved, we started to see lighter cameras and you started to have from this in the 60s and 70s, you started to see documentaries being more of a spontaneous capturing of events. Um, I think it's probably similar to how today we have iPhones and you're seeing the these spontaneous events. And there's that blurred line of is this documentaries? This is real. This is real life filmmaking, but it's just in the moment um, spontaneous events. Um, then you see the rise of television through the 60s, and this gave rise to a journalistic documentary for filmmaking. Um, you start to see the Ken Burns, um, Attenborough, BBC type of documentaries coming out during this time. And you see these type of journalistic documentaries being very informative in terms of an issue or a perspective going on in a different area. And those watching it really did, they tended to be those that the audience were seeking this type of films out in, in many ways. And then in the 2000s, everybody might remember Inconvenient yeah, Truth. Or a perspective going on in it. Fahrenheit, 450, Fahrenheit 9 9-11, um, Food Inc. Um, you start to see this in the early knots and Hollywood, you know, starts to see the success of box office hits like these, and you get this real rise in these type of documentary storytelling mediums um, in the early knots and in the, over the last 20 years. However, we're seeing, like starting in 2010, when you started to see a, a rise in social media, a rise in different platforms, Netflix, Hulu, Amazon, um, it starts changing how films are distributed, how they reach people. You no longer have this targeted box office theatrical in the theaters type of um, distribution. And it starts, it's starting to change um, how documentaries are made. And it's also, we're also able with this new technology of social media, mass media, we're starting to see a greater response and feedback from people, um, from different stakeholders at a faster rate that is also informative for the documentary process. So, and I think the next slide, I was going to quickly just go over what that, sorry, the first slide, if you could go back one, my fault. Um, the documentary filmmaking process has, still follows today, and the traditional process is we produce, we find an, an issue or a message that we want to create. Um, this There's research, story narrative, filming, the actual filming and the editing, and this is the production side. Typically, this film is then made, and then it is handed over and then given to a distributor, or there's some type of outreach or partnership with the nonprofit to really highlight and target the audience that you want this um, the film to reach, or to really get mass appeal at this point. Um, and ultimately, keeping in mind of the audience is the impact. Um, there's, here I list four types of impact. It's really raising awareness of an issue, 
um, creating that individual behavior change, raising a, a societal awareness to where it, it becomes, um, it, it's placed on an agenda for political discussion. And then finally, really the action that's needed to create the laws to enable and support these type of um, cons behavioral, individual behavior changes and to start to see actionable, or like a little bit more meaningful change at a, a larger scale. And the next slide, and here's where the participatory documentary filmmaking process. And this is what I wanted to, this where I see David's expertise in and his expertise being really engaging um, the audience or the end user in his filmmaking process. And participatory means really taking into consideration where is this film going? Who is the audience of the film? And as a, a viewer of the film, um, do I relate to the filmmaker? And this is very much um, seen in the, his last film, the, um, the Eerie Situation. And I wanted to just discuss with him today and get his feedback on his creative process on getting that feedback from an end user or the stakeholder and how that uh, how new times and new distribution platforms are affecting his creative process. And that is the context. Um, and so great to have you, David. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Um, the situation wouldn't have happened without Plastic Ocean's involvement. It would have uh, been, you know, a hundred and some odd plus hours of footage sitting on a shelf. Uh, you know, piecemeal little segments coming out of it. And, uh, you know, you guys really got us over the over the finish line with the film. And, you know, that's why that's why we're here today. I, and it's I, I think what it highlights and I have super appreciate you saying that I think it it also highlights the limitations of the existing traditional filmmaking process in the in the distribution side where often a distributor is only looking for not necessarily focused only on impact or the reach and the power of the film to create change but it's only it's predominantly looking for a financial return and therefore it shortens the the shelf life or the lifespan that it that a distributor can put into a film and Working with the Erie situation, um, it has over the last year, year and a half, it really has highlighted how powerful it is to extend that that distribution period beyond just a box office or how interesting it is at opening or the release date and maybe a few months after it starts to highlight how much time it is needed to get to different communities to discuss the information in it to uh, um, to For sure. Uh, well, and when you don't have like a huge marketing budget, uh, you know, what, what we've seen with the Erie situation is somebody hears about it. You know, somebody goes to a film festival, they see it. They're like, oh, I want to bring this back to my town. I, I got a group that wants to see this. You know, somebody in that venue sees it and they're like, oh, I got a group. They need to see it. And, and so you kind of have this organic snowballing effect where I don't even know, Julie, how many screenings we've had. I'm going to another one today. It's been a few weeks now since I've, you know, or months since we've had, uh, you know, a venue that I'm attending, but I, I know there's been other ones. There was just another one in Toledo a week and a half ago. And, you know, this is a, uh, this is a year and a half after we had the premiere. So uh, it's still relevant. You know, the film and the content in the film was, 2019 and, and scientifically and politically, maybe some things have evolved since then, but in terms of the, 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 the message and the, the, the story, you know, is it, you know, still a relevant story? I think that answer is yes. And, you know, we've, we've demonstrated with this that and to, to the surprise of, I think a lot of us, um, the longevity of a film like this, in an area that's very specific, you know, I don't want to, you know, it's specific, but it's in a region really that is struggling with a very unique in terms of its scope and scale problem. Um, and the, you know, the more people that are becoming aware of the problem, 
the more people are talking about the issue and then the more this film gets brought up and like, oh, well, you need to see that. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and so it's still having an impact. Um, I can, I can keep going. Uh, no, it, it, I, I just heard some new things yesterday for like, one of the main characters in the film, uh, Eddie Verhamey. He's the limnotech scientist that's a, you know, kind of featured in the boat. He was just at the state of the science conference, which is something that Ohio Sea Grant puts on every year outside of Toledo, where everybody talks about, you know, the research they've been doing. Um, and you know, like this has had a, a, an impact on the scientific community and the political community um, because the unfortunately uh, so much of the funding for research is 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 guided by the politics that are surrounding the issue and and so even even at a reputable organization like Sea Grant, they're tied to Ohio State University, which is deeply tied to the agricultural industry. Uh, it's a land grant university. You know, they're like, oh, well, we know, you know, we're, we got to move away from talking about how the CAFOs are the problem, concentrated animal feeding operations are the problem. You know, we got to get we got to get away from that. So like hidden in that, you know, between the lines is like, you know, this film got out there and it's and it's and it's and it's not aligned with the 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 accepted messaging of the establishment on on how to confront this problem. So we've basically been a, pe a pain in people's ass who are having to respond to this film because it's not it's upsetting the apple cart. It's giving people more information than they're getting from these folks on the issue. And it's and it's a you know, it's it's more broadly inclusive in terms of the multiple facets and aspects of this problem. Um, you know, not just a data point or several data points. It's it's about people and uh, what people are doing, how they're being impacted by this, and looking at things in a way that the establishment is is has not been willing to do to this point. And, and and that's that's created problems for them, uh, and they've had to respond to this. And it sounds like you know the spin is still there, um, but you know what? Like that's kind of cool that you know we've 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 become this sort of pain in their ass. Um, and, I think you're, and it's, you're definitely, it's motivating. You're definitely highlighting the process of change is in the discourse is really targeting the different stakeholders that can affect change that want to affect change and but it's an iterative process of communication hearing this sort of the negative you're knowing that there is it's hitting certain i guess pushing certain buttons on some stakeholders but it's all part of the process of getting well yeah it, i mean it was two days after we premiered the thing at the Cleveland International Film Festival that the Ohio Farm Bureau wrote a 1500 word essay, you know, concluding the film was unconscionable and without merit. The fact that they felt they had to respond to it at all, uh, you know, was was a sign of success. <laughs> um, definitely. And it's and that's part of the, the process. And I think just to give some context to those that may not have seen the eerie yeah. situation, but the eerie situation is from the perspective of these algae blooms within the Lake Erie in particular, but that's caused from agricultural runoff and the, the systems of, you know, what it highlights is that it is unregulated and you're getting lots of mass, mass nutrients um, dumping into the lake, which is causing another problem and affecting the ecosystem of the lakes. But, you know, from the reason that plastic oceans got behind it, 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 it highlights the importance of where water regulation is and where how what is right. treated and I, the, how do we change our existing systems to manage our water runoff and what's in our water and how do we treat it better so that we secure um, cleaner water for every, for all people and the surrounding communities and how we can apply some of those lessons and share those lessons.
Um, and, you know, as you highlight that you're going to, you have so much controversy from different stakeholders, it, it really highlights in your process of filmmaking, how you have been very inclusive of multiple stakeholders. And I guess, how important is it to you and how, to get to know those stakeholders in, in your community, like in this, in the filmmaking process? What did you have to do? How important was it for you to start to identify the different stakeholders to create a more yeah. holistic, um, storytelling um, of this problem? Well, the film really started out as a much smaller concept where we were actually going to, uh, you know, ride the coattails of this existing scientific effort that happened one year. It was going to happen a second year called the Habs Grab, where all these different organizations go out on the same day and collect water samples and compare them in a lab to get a snapshot of what's happening on the lake. And there was like an opportunity for uh, entities to apply for some additional federal funding. Um, and that group was, you know, like, oh, okay, well, you know, if we were to increase our wish list of things that we would do during this event, you know, what would that look like? And and then I got kind of involved in that. And, you know, I was going to produce some media about it. Um, that ended up not getting funded. But at that point, uh, you know, the, I mean, the, the Habs grab itself was still going to happen. They just didn't like the, all these additional things weren't going to be funded. That money went somewhere else. But I was already kind of like interested and in, hooked into the problem from, a, you know, kind of curiosity standpoint. Um, you know, I'm from the west side of Michigan, so we don't typically see algae blooms like this in, in Lake Michigan and, uh, you, you know, wanting to kind of understand more about like this big issue that had made the national news in one of the Great Lakes was was kind of the driving force behind this. And then Eddie, who I mentioned before, you know, is just like always talking about this and very passionate about it. And, you know, when you're around somebody like that, you, you, you see how important this is to someone working in the environmental community on, on a technological level. I and mean, this is someone who, after the citizens of Toledo didn't have clean drinking water for 72 hours because they were sucking this algae bloom into their water plant. Um, you know, Eddie was one of these part of the, a company that responded to help the water treatment plant know when something like that might be entering the plant. And there's just a lot of money, you know, looking at different aspects of algae blooms from, you know, the gene the genetic level all the way up to, um, you, you, you know, density in the water, uh, you know, satellite imagery, airplanes, all, all kinds of stuff. And how best to treat it, how best to deal with it. Um, and, you know, some, some, some looking into like how, you know, how's it getting here? And, and, and really the research has kind of been very like, general, even today, on, you know, well, it's coming from the river. And well, what's up the river? Well, farmland. And, 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 and now today, uh, post Erie situation, it sounds like that's the state is is looking more into trying to identify more specifically, like you know, what parts of the river is it entering, and you know, can we start to pinpoint even more? But in, in terms of telling the story, you know, it started it started with the scientific community and meeting people through uh, through Ed uh, and my background at NOAA kind of gave me you know, removed a little red tape with dealing with and wanting to interact with some of the federal agencies um, and, and really looking at like, just like, how are we studying this? Why are we studying this? Um, but then ultimately, like, what what is that information used for? Um, is what you end up doing in the film and which is, diff you know, rather than just focusing on the science and saying, oh, I'm going to share the science and yeah. let, it, let people take it in and do what <clears throat> they want with it. And, you know, I would say, you know, in a historical sense, that is sort of the, the, the start of documentary filmmaking in the Ken Burns and area, but where you started telling a story narrative is then you started incorporating in the film, you have the yeah. 
the the citizen of Ken and you have the far sure. perspective and then you have legislation and you start to see this a more complicated processing of that scientific information and that yeah. story. How did you come about going from just this limited perspective and then starting to integrate into integrate different perspectives to create that story narrative? Well, you know, shortly after the, I think it was like a algae bloom forecast event at Ohio State's Stone Lab. Um, you, you know, that's where you meet all the reporters that have been covering this issue. That's where you meet all the scientists who are sort of part of the key laboratories that 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 collect data. Um, the bloom started happening like a week and a half later um earlier than they had predicted it and uh but you, you you start to hear more about agriculture at that point um and and so that's where i kind of knew that i needed to head upstream and try and figure out you know and start start to understand how agriculture could be influencing something like this and how um uh certain certain policies or um practices were 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 either popular or continuing or what were people trying how aware was the farming community of their you know the fact that they're kind of blamed for this um and and that you know led to finding folks who were maybe you know, not super focused on, on Lake Erie itself, but very focused on healthy agriculture, uh, soil health, you know, as far removed from in, uh, what we might call industrial agriculture, as you might think of. Of course, there's a lot of industrial agriculture in Ohio. So I want, you know, you're, you're, all this information is really heavy and it's really dense and scientific, like you said. So, so what does that mean to the average people? What does that mean to, um, you know, the farmer? And what does that mean to the, the citizens who, okay, the plant, the water plants responded to the crisis and now they have things in place so that they're not gonna have that kind of a crisis again. But, you know, so you can trust what's coming out of your tap, but what does that do for the people who still live by the lake? You know where these blooms are massive. I mean, in 2019, it was like 600 square miles, um, and, and depending on wind direction, you know, it's like pushed up into these water communities. Um, and we know that people can breathe this stuff. Um, you know, it can aerosolize, and and they found cyanobacterial toxins 30 kilometers inland. You know, from from blooms like this. So I wanted to find. I mean, really, these people started finding me. I started posting pictures on Facebook about things we were learning along the way. And I think like I boosted a couple posts in, of, you know, pictures of big green monster out on Lake Erie in the Toledo area. And that's where people started kind of finding us. And so that's how, the, you know, one particular character in the film ended up in the film was was they kept sending me video of their experience on their sailboat of you know going through these things these nasty algae blooms and you can just tell in those videos that this person's upset and doesn't understand what's going on and um you know wants answers and i was like well you know i'm gonna go talk to this person and you know that's ken and ken ken you know he's just kind of a just kind of a what would you say central casting kind of person from uh point place ohio someone who knows a lot of people and a lot of people know him um but he's unassuming he's not like you know jumping to conclusions on things and he kind of serves as like you know multiple roles in this he's someone who cares about the water he's grown up around the water he's been on the water his entire life um but then this thing is happening and he and he wants to learn more about it. Well, our film, our audience, you know, we're assuming they also want to learn something about this. And so he's kind of the 
the person that we care about who's going through this learning experience of, of what's going on as the, the story of the film unfolds. And um, I, th I think we, need, we needed something like that to make this information presentable. Uh, otherwise, it would have just been your really dense, you know, uh, scientific data, political information, that kind of a thing. And what Ken does as a, he is, as I hate repeat, it's either the end user, he is the citizen that is being impacted by a problem, but he is, he is an, act, an individual activist in terms of he wants to learn and do what he can and learn yeah. what he can be of help. And that's where, in what it highlights um, is that his feedback as an audience, was only a, a, only able because of the technology we have today. If we didn't have the social yeah. media twenty years ago, you may not have found Ken um, yeah. without social media and or some type of this type of technology where you can we can get fast feedback from those those end users or the stakeholders that can affect either change in terms of influencing behavior changes or I mean he's gotten calls from political change a congresswoman so exactly. you know like I she wanted to go out to dinner with the guy um, you know so like he's now a known person <laughs> and you know you can kind of he kind of loves hates it you know mm -hmm. but um there was the option there was the option of you know covering more closely these these I would call them hardcore activists who are really upset about this issue. And they're included in the film to some degree because that's part of the scenery of, of, of what's happening around this issue. But um, yeah, I, did, I didn't want this to be an activist film per se. I wanted this to be a film for the average person who hasn't yet really been able to wrap their mind around what's going on. And, and, and that's, that, that means we're not going to go stand over here with the choir who's throwing rocks at the, you know, the establishment. It's, it's, it's someone who, who's, you know, trying to put the pieces together to, to really wrap their brain around, um, it, you know, the most effective thing that a, a, a citizen can do who's, who's impacted by this. Mm -hmm. and, I, and when I say that it's not so much maybe in the creative process, what's interesting is that you said uh, you didn't create the film you know, to directly for activists, but it is about informing. And, you know, part of the filmmaking process is, is developing it you know, as a creative developer of the narrative, taking that feedback and producing something that a distributor, and this is where I think Plastic Oceans comes into play, is we are actively trying to find those like Ken or those community leaders that may not know of the information that you're providing in the film, the messages, but being able to utilize that message to engage in conversation within their communities and see and really for organizations like Plastic Oceans and all of our Blue community members, really that how they work is providing the feedback of here's a misunderstanding, here's still a gap of knowledge here's the challenges we have to even create change. I mean, it's easy to say, here's the problem, go change, but you have X number of factors that may be barriers to those change. Like I think yeah. you, you start well, to learn that there's policies in place that prevent you from changing. And, you know, something else that's interesting, and this was not necessarily intentional, I think it just sort of happened organically. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the two, the two like, people that we you know are sort of the driving f characters in the in the story farmer farmer joe hammond and the point place resident ken saban um you know both of these guys are probably not people that when we go to the election polls uh, you know in november we probably don't vote the same way on on you know or to vote for the same people um and and, and and that's kind of I'm not saying that like that was a choice, but like the, the the feeling, the sense I got from these folks was that they they cared about this issue just as much as anybody on on some other, you know, like traditionally the the, the liberals or the environmentalists or whatever. Uh, these, these these individuals both wanted clean water and clean dirt to grow food in 
as well, they maybe are just coming at it, you know, from a different way. And Joe, you know, thinks of it uh, from a from a biblical standpoint of do no harm to your neighbor. And, uh, you know, Ken is just, you know, someone who uh, doesn't want to see his community economically impacted or have the ability to enjoy, you know, being out on a sailboat be directly impacted by this disaster. And so I, I think it's really easy to reach those activist types if, 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 uh, if all you want to do is focus on activism and how mad this group of people is. Um, but uh, the people that you, whose minds you really need to change are, are, are perhaps the ones that are more embedded with, uh, you know, tribes that, that, that don't traditionally support um, or think of or prioritize uh, these kinds of issues on a list of, you know, what are your key issues of going to the polls this fall? Um, environmental conservation, I doubt is on the top of, you know, uh, uh, someone, someone voting for Donald Trump this, this, you know, this next election. I doubt that's near the top of their list. Um, but if, if, if on a local level, at least, um, and, 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 and growing slight, you know, slightly more into the state level, which maybe then has more of a national impact, uh, we can see how these, these issues have a direct impact on, pe on people in that area. And then they can, start to integrate that perspective into some of the some of these groups who might not necessarily be paying attention to this issue and so then the the people in the film are the audience in the sense that they represent the kinds of folks that we're trying to reach uh and and you know ken goes from being this i don't know what the hell's going on other than my lake is green to we see towards the end of the movie he's he's showing up at these events these yeah. uh you know community organizer events where people are learning about what the state's doing or um you know being concerned about the way the state is trying to address the problem um and, and the impacts that might have on on people in their in his community so you 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 see this whole sort of evolution you know that is sort of the evolution that we want our audience to have, right? Of, of I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing to, okay, you know, I'm gonna take a step into this meeting room where people are making decisions or, or talking about what our state's priorities are. And, and that right there is, 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 is really, that's the change, that's the measured change. You know, more people doing that um, is the change that, that we can hope for. I think, well, I, what you mentioned is also a lot of the complexity of problem solving. You know, here is an issue. You think we all oh. hope for the one, the one quick fix, but you start to see the complexity of perspectives and uh, the system itself. Um, I get I, what is difficult to capture is, within whether it is a small community, the Great, a regional area like the Great Lakes or a problem that is seen, you know, algae blooms, agricultural runoff, water, you know, just water runoff, unregulated water runoff is seen around the world. And we're seeing contamination and algae bloom all through lake, in lakes all over the world. Um, how much, like in finding all of your key perspectives and audience and stakeholders, like how much do you have to be invested in your, that community? to really identify and relate to those stories and those perspectives. Well, I guess, what, what do you mean by invested in? What, what I guess, I, um, I know that you live in the Great Lakes yeah. region and you probably have a, maybe a, a deeper understanding, maybe a, a more relatable understanding to those. To For sure. Um, well, I guess, I, could I somebody say, from, yeah. I guess could somebody from Asia, you know, or somebody right. from Los Angeles, could we have made the same film and really understood those perspectives or um, in the same way that you developed it, you think? I, I think, I think what, what, what gives me a leg up on, on maybe this particular type of thing is that like, I'm like Ken, I'm someone who grew up on a great lake. And when I, I feel like 
if that, if his experience is anything like mine, then you, you, you look at that body of water, uh, like a family member or, 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 or something like this. And, and so I have that relationship and that perspective of the great lake that I grew up near. Um, and, and, you know, for people who aren't from around here, who've never been here and they've only seen it on a map, I mean, you can't see the other side, you know, like these are oceans, these are inland seas, they're massive. They're, uh, people who see them for the first time are like, wait, I had no idea that you couldn't, you know, see the other side, or I had no idea this was this big. Um, yeah. And there's 10,000 shipwrecks in them because they're even more dangerous than the ocean. So, uh, I feel like I come at it from a perspective of knowing what it's like to care about the water. Right. And, and I have that and, and, and I've been doing, you know, focusing on stories related to the environment and, and uh, water quality and, you know, citizens being impacted by some practice or some company or, or, or some, you know, failure to, to address a need. Um, I've been telling those kinds of stories since I was 21 years old or something like that. Uh, so, you, you know, being, being able to uh, relate to that community or relate to somebody like Ken, um, I think, I think it, 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 it's a little more obvious. And it's something I don't necessarily like consciously think of, uh, you know, like, well, I'm a late guy, so he must be like me. It, it, it is just sort of, an unspoken sort of thing, but I'm also pretty good at, um, you know, playing devil's advocate too. So I, I kind of more naturally go into that role when I'm talking with people like, well, you know, like, uh, how do, how do we know that, the, the you know, that, that agriculture is, you know, responsible for this or, you know, what, you know, you're, you're, you're upset about this, you know, how do you know that, you know, what makes you so convinced that, you know, this is the reason for that? I mean, a lot of people say that this is the reason for that. Or, um, so that's just my style of filmmaking or whatever. But um, I think it's pretty, you know, I, I do have a lot of contacts in the Great Lakes area region, you know, in the scientific community, uh, whether that's people actually doing research or communicating science, uh, you know, by extension, these federal agencies, I work with all the time, uh, doing media for them on any number of projects that they're involved in to either clean up toxic areas or, um, uh, you know, the, the, we have the, a program called the Air, uh, Great Lakes Areas of Concern, which is 47 sites, I think 46 or 47 sites throughout the Great Lakes that have experienced the consequences of industrial pollution for years and federal dollars going to like clean these things up. Uh, that's a story I tell all the time is, you know, this place was dirty, people got together, they pulled resources, the federal government, you know, worked with them, the state worked with them, and, and now look at this place today, you know, people are coming back and they're doing this sort of thing. So I like, I get that process and, and, you know, this is, this is one of those things where the, the, the problem is, is bigger than an area of concern, you know, and there's national implications, there's federal laws, there's, um, there's, there's political influence, there's lobbying, there's, there's the, 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 um, uh, accepted, storyline that the that the that the the, the, the the leaders of the the talking heads of the problem or you know quote unquote problem uh you know adhere to you know whether because there's they norm and i think that's what it also you what has changed like over the last 10 years we now have social media that is we get rapid feedback now and uh, you know, documentaries still have a story, storytelling aspect, which is not, you know, um, TikTok or Instagram stories. And, you know, there's a, a storytelling within a documentary that starts to showcase the the complexities that you're, yeah, you're, you're covering. You're you're talking about. Given that we are getting feedback faster, there is sort of a, the traditional production time of documentaries taking 
two years, three years, four years. How do you think that changes in a in today's rapid like need for or I guess rapid information processing, sharing the the story norms that you you're talking about are yeah. being held or well, disaster with those social media. How does that affect you? Or how I do mean, you I, I can give I can give I, you know the story of the, making this film was you know finding different organizations that were you know maybe interested in the topic you know kind of nonpartisan non you know advocacy organizations that were just interested in in seeing meaningful progress in the lake getting better um and you know kind of finding money to get the ball rolling that way i i also was hired by the ohio epa at the same time to do a big project um in the same region in the same area so you know if that hadn't happened i don't know if this film would have happened because that just afforded me this other project this paid gig afforded me time coincidentally at the same time that i was in ohio and i've got this shoelace budget for you know this sort of passion project that's you know evolving and who knows what it's going to be um and then this paid gig that that, that is affording me days on end down in 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 ohio region so you know th those th that was super important at the time i'm not saying it made me like lazy in terms of going to find more money or something like that but you know, we were looking for the money for this project um but uh you, you know and then eventually i had a relationship grow with detroit public television's great lakes now which is a pbs uh, show airs once a month. They usually do three segments a month. Now that you know, there's a lot of articles online. They're in partnership with Michigan Radio and Bridge Michigan and all these other outlets, as well as all the other PBS affiliates in the in the region, like 18 that they're tied into. And uh, you know, they saw some of the footage that I was gathering in Ohio, and they're like, "Yeah, you know, we'd like a segment from this, or maybe two segments." And so then, you know, that keeps the ball rolling and that's gets part of, you know, pieces of the story out there, um, you know, before the movie itself, you know, gets out there. And, um, you know, we tried to do that in a way that wasn't going to spoil our characters. I don't think Ken is in any of those. I think Farmer Joe might be in in those to some extent, but we didn't we don't introduce like our main character, like the, the main thread of the eerie situation is sort of kept out of these. And these are more scientific um you know with a with a narrator you know kind of pulling you through this sort of thing and those things were all like super important to keeping the ball rolling it was motivating and, and that you know we've got public television telling us like this is important stuff we should get it on the air you know you're on to something good or you're doing the right thing um and that then was lending more credibility to the kind of film we were trying to make we weren't trying to make a film that was going to go on ifc we were trying to, you know, I wanted a film that would end up on public television um, because to me that that says like, you, you know, you, you're adhering to journalistic principles and you're 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 not um, you, you can have a perspective, but you're not you're not like blatantly ignoring something. To, to, to push this idea over here or something like that. I think we, and you also highlight I just wanted to put out there is that, you know, as this is using film to create actionable changes, even as a filmmaker, you're taking in the, well, from a distribution side, like you, like you said, you have a TV channel, like, can you give us content here? And breaking that down so that it can be further used to add to the conversation that is needed for change. Yeah, uh, and, totally. And what we're seeing and how we've used um, the Erie situation at Plastic Oceans you know, and I, I can't emphasize enough that, you know, the traditional form of documentary distribution is maybe six months and, you know, and then it's on to the next film. But because we continue to use the eerie situation, I'd say the first three, six months of the film, we did have, we had 25 major screenings. Um, but over since then, you know, over the last year and a half, even this year, we've had over a hundred screenings worldwide. And well, a lot see, of this is this is like news to me. <laughs> and then the and the feedback we get from people is 
you know, and in, as it reaches outside of the Great Lakes region, it's maybe less, there's components of the film, the long form of the film that are relatable because maybe we're not in the Great Lakes, but the information of within it is very, the science, the, the relatability of it as a citizen that Ken plays as a citizen and his role sure. trying to understand and protect his, his community is very relatable. And, you know, we're working on a shorter film because the feedback from those who have watched it said, you know, it'd be great if this was a little bit more condensed without the sort of the context, location context specific. Oh, yeah. but what it does is then you're still continuing that conversation in a collective way to really highlight a, a global problem, but really we all have to work at a community yeah. a local level. And I think that's really the you're, power that you're doing as a filmmaker. You're reminding me of a book that I think I read and maybe it was grad school called uh, Fans, Friends and Followers. Uh, which was, you know, basically exactly what you're talking about, which, it, you know, it's like this, you're, you're engaged with your audience from the beginning, you're getting their feedback from the beginning. And, and, and they're along for the ride. Um, at least that's like the like what's sort of advocated for in this book. Um, and, and I think that we are doing that to some extent that that's how we find people that end up, it happened for my thesis film at American University. That's how I found some characters for that film was, was talking about what we were doing, people responding to what we were doing. We don't, we haven't even done it yet, but they like what we're talking about. And, and, and they, they know more about this issue than I do. Um, and, or they're experiencing it in, in a, in a way that, you don't hear published in the newspaper articles. So that, that, that is key. I think, I mean, that, that, that is what, what you're talking about. And, and the idea, you know, I think that we all kind of came from this world where, you know, like you don't get to go see Oppenheimer until the day it opens in the theater, right? Like you might see a trailer for the, the movie, right? But you don't get to, you don't get to see this little spinoff uh, or, or this little thing that, 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 that they're making to you know, pay the bills along the way. That's also sort of getting information out there. That, that, that's a whole different thing. Um, and I think that if, if you're not doing these sorts of things today, uh, you're, you're limiting, you're, you're, you're really limiting your own understanding of the issue um but then you're also not building this audience that you're gonna need you know based off of the likely budget that you're gonna have for distribution I mean, you're gonna need these people to talk about it uh what when, when you're done with it and you, they should be just more excited about it because you're exhausted by the time you're done with the movie you're just like it's shit like just get it out there just, i'm done but they you know they're excited about it mm -hmm. so they they're the they start championing it. I mean, you and I were on the phone yesterday talking about influencers, and we think of like what an influencer means today. But an influencer, you know, isn't necessarily someone who's a professional influencer. An influencer is someone who's part of a community that other people listen to. Exactly. Uh, maybe not necessarily on social media because they have an Instagram or a TikTok or something, but you know people who boat in the state of Ohio and Western Lake Erie, you know, like there's probably a couple key people who people listen to about weather reports or, you know, how's the fishing today? And those are the people you need to, to reach. Those are the influencers. And, and that is a, and that's, I can't, since this is part of trees and seas and I know you have a hard stop at 11 or in five minutes. Um, but that is why we do this film activism festival. It is engaging these communities, identifying those key influencers that are actively working to improve their community, actively trying to spread in information that could help their community, advocating not for necessarily propaganda, but advocating for change and to improve their again, their environment, their their people, their culture. And I think, you know, even in the Erie situation where Ken is 
you know, he is your average citizen, but he does become an advocate for wanting to protect his environment and the, his community that he's grown up loving. And, yeah. and I think it's so, it's been, well, it's been an honor to like spread your film, but it is also the feedback that we get from all of these key influencers and leaders within their communities and around the world, we get back saying, here's what we're doing. Here are some, this is more how we're continuing the conversation. This is the knowledge gaps that we have or the misunderstandings that we wish we could spread more. And that's where I think the power of film um, has the, this ability um, to really yeah. collectively inform in a way. Um, I think he's showing our films, our, our current film my reason as we continue to grow and I hope to have a part it not part two, but like an evolution of the Erie situation in a different way, in a different discussion soon, based on the feedback we've had um, over the last year and a half, and how to continue that conversation to really see actionable change. Not just, a, I know awareness is key to create change, but then there is a point where that awareness needs to be converted to action and to see change. Well, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just say like two things. Um, one thing that I heard from Eddie yesterday, who was at that state of the science thing, um, and we were kind of talking about the establishment and how, you know, we've upset the apple cart. And it, it, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but it was brilliant. And I'm not even sure he realized like what he was saying, but like, you know, when there's, when, you know, we were talking about this film and why we made it and, and and i asked him whether it was effective or not you know based off of things that that he's seen he, going to conferences like this and these are the these are the people that can change things and he 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 had said something about well first off we've upset the apple cart um but then you know like in talking about how you know we're focusing on not just science but on people's stories and how you know, there's a big movement of this in the scientific community now, especially with regards to projects where you're going to have like native, uh, you know, indigenous people involved in a project. And you've got this Western science, this Western scientific methodology. But this group is also part of the project and they rely on an oral tradition of lived experience to understand a situation or a place. And, and that's really what I think we're doing with a film like this is, you, you know, like we, we, we don't, the, the science is the science, the science is, 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 is being done a certain way. But what Eddie said was, you know, when you, when, when the science that's being funded uh, to study a particular thing is, you know, far removed from what the the people need or the people want in a in a particular place, you've got a problem. You've got a very serious problem, and and so that that I think is like what we were able to do here and the kind of thing that we were able to start. I forget what the second thing I was I was going to say, but uh, that yeah. that the way he said that, you know, like really struck me, and it was very simple. No, it's very simple. I know, and I think that is a, a beautiful way to end this in the sense that it is, at the end of the day, those that actually create change are at, you know, the, the indigenous people, they're the local populations, they're the local communities that are going to create change. And to just assume that, inf you know, the methodologies, the science, the information coming from top down is just going to make sense. Um, right is not going to affect that actionable change. And that's where I think this is where the beauty of what you're doing and the filmmaking of integrating the different perspectives, the challenges, um, the barriers, and the different stories from those people wanting to create change, wanting to protect yeah. their cultures, their environments, um, their communities. Yeah. 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 You know, just to briefly, I think the second thing I wanted to add to that was at, you know, at, at, at its core, you know, we're still telling good stories. Like that's, that's ultimately the goal. And I, my advice to anyone who's interested in this kind of a thing is to, to really be aware of how you feel through the experience to really, you know, 
um, recognize and acknowledge how you feel through the experience. And, and because that's, if you're doing your job well, that's, that's what the audience will feel as well. And to, to, to not miss that or, you know, move past it because, you know, somebody told you to go over here or something like that, you know, and, and to really acknowledge how you're feeling during the process. And that's how you'll know that you're following the right story. And that's also when you'll know that you've gotten the material that you need to put something together. You know, how do you know when you're done, when you've got everything that you need? And, and, and I think like, if you feel like you've answered the question that you're trying to answer, then, then, then probably the audience who's going to watch your movie will feel the same way. Fantastic. Well, on that, it's 11 of oh, it's one minute after. So I will let, thank you so much, David. This has been amazing. I got a couple of minutes if there was a question. If there, I don't, I, here it's not. I know we're streaming live also. Um, don't know if there's any questions, but if, given that we are a little late, no questions on that side. No, I, I should probably, I didn't see questions coming up. That's why I like ran it. I let us just keep our discussion going. Um, Again, thank you so much, David. This has been amazing. It's been super impactful, like your work, and we continue to push it um, and affect change in terms of how that the film, the eerie situation, and for those watching, I guess, check out our other films and see how they can also be used to add to civil discourse. <laughs> awesome. Thanks so much, David. Julie, it's been great. I really appreciate you. Uh putting this yeah. together and um good luck with everything today i know you're going off to uh, shoot something else <laughs> well, we'll do a, i got a eerie situation panel oh well, you, you know what? so we're oh. headed there today i don't know if i'm blacklisted if i can still get across the border but we'll see good luck with that talk to you soon bye Thank mm -hmm. you.